My conversation today is with author and alchemist Robert Allen Bartlett. Robert has spent half a century as a practicing alchemist and was trained under Albert Riedel, better known as Frater Albertus, at Paracelsus College. Robert's work has been invaluable to modern alchemy and the alchemical practice of Spagirio. He has worked with and trained an entire generation of alchemists and continues to be at the forefront of the field. His books, Real Alchemy, A Primer of Practical Alchemy, The Way of the Crucible, and The Temper of Herbs are mainstays and mile markers, which are as timeless as they are accessible. Robert's latest venture is TriStar Alchemy, an online alchemical collective and educational platform whose mission is to serve as the preeminent source of knowledge, research, and education in the fields of alchemy and spagyrics while promoting the conscious evolution of humanity. TriStar offers memberships, videos, and classes with Robert and a team of expert alchemists from all over the world. Humble, grounded, and a clear master of his art, it was my great pleasure and honor to speak with Robert. I'm Ike Baker, and this is the Arcanum Podcast. I'm so happy that you're here, Robert. Thank you so much for for joining me. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Always a pleasure. Yeah, I love. I always love seeing um, uh, your background there. the The laboratory, the the alchemical stuff. It's just yeah, so. You're at the lab today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. It's fantastic. So. I'm sure a lot of my um, my listeners, or or at least a, a decent amount of them, are familiar with your work. I certainly was tremendously influenced by uh, Real Alchemy. It was the the first and and probably the only primer on how to get started and in, in in doing basic alchemy uh, that just renovated not only my perspective of alchemy, but also incorporated new ideas philosophically and and, and historically. Uh, so before we jump into any of that material, I wanted to see, you know, who doesn't love an origin story? Uh, I was, I wanted to ask you how you came to alchemy. Did you always want to be an alchemist? <laughs> well, you see the lab behind me. Uh, yeah. This, this has been growing since I was about nine years old. Um, as I grew up in a family. My dad owned a die casting business. So I grew up around metal working machines, uh, molten metals, big furnaces. And anyway, my interest as a kid was uh, in rocks. I had a rock collection. And um, I discovered there were things you could do to rocks to figure out their, their names. And one of my favorites was a blowpipe analysis where you take a small blowpipe and you direct a candle or a um, alcohol burner flame uh, against a mineral and look at colors, uh, melt it, fuse it with different salts like borax and look at the colored bead that forms. Uh, this was all like great fun for me, you know. Um, so I went to the library looking for information on testing minerals. Um, and I discovered a section on, on alchemy and it intrigued me because uh, here they were talking about minerals and metals, but now all of a sudden astrology or astronomy was evolved. They're talking about Saturn and Jupiter and the sun and, and in the same breath as the metals and minerals. And so it intrigued me. I took it home and uh, started reading it. Um, it was very uh, difficult to follow, you know, at my age group. <laughs> it was kind of over my head philosophically, you know. Uh, but I did find one book, the, um, uh, the Story of Chemistry or Alchemy and Early Chemistry by uh, John Maxon Stillman. And it had some practical techniques and details of uh, how to do uh, alchemy. Uh, he talked about the different ages and periods. Um, one of them was making an, an artificial emerald. And I thought that would be cool. I, I had everything I needed except the ass of a urine. I mean, the urine of an ass. Um, this was an old Greek formula, so I figured I would use the next closest thing, you know. Uh, 
I always say that I could blame his failure on not being enough of an ass. But uh, <laughs> time went on, I started studying um, other associated um, topics of alchemy, associated with alchemy, like astrology and, and magic, Kabbalah. I got involved with uh, Israel Rigardi's writings and the Golden Dawn because in this was the 70s. It was about the only useful material out there. Um, and at one point, Rigardi <clears throat> mentions, um, well, he introduced the Alchemist Handbook by Frater Albertus in, in the Llewellyn New Times. Uh, and it, that piqued my interest. I sent it away. I mean, here was a guy teaching the very things I had been looking for all these years. Uh, so I uh, got a copy of the Alchemist Handbook and um, sent away. I got the uh, got the book. I also got a an application to the classes in the PRS classes in Utah, and so I signed up and got accepted and took my first class in 1974. Uh, that was uh, and these were like two week long classes. Uh, from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., and then lab work going on through the whole period, and you're pretty much cloistered there. Nobody went out except to get food. Um, there were no TVs, no radios, no newspapers. So you were just totally immersed in this alchemical uh, class, and um, that was just one class. So two weeks of that every year for seven years. And a couple of years into it, Frater Albertus mentioned uh, they were reorganizing, starting up Paralab, uh, which was the commercial offshoot of the classes. They were going to make materials uh, based on the teachings. Uh, so I wanted to work there. And Frater Albertus' suggestion was that I go return to school and finish my degree in chemistry. Uh, and then he said my work would be waiting. So I did that. I uh, returned to school and finished my degree. And after graduation, became the chief chemist at Paralab and um, worked directly with Rod Albertus and uh, Dr. Shine, the medical director there. Um, we developed a whole line of mineral metallic medicines for um, uh, alternate health care and uh, research purposes. Um, and then after the Paralab closed, Frater Albertus died in 1984. The school closed up right away and Paralab was not far behind. Uh, I kept myself employed as a, a chemist at the bench level uh, because of something Frater Albertus had charged me with uh, gathering analytical data on all the products that we were making. And he, he told me to keep collecting as much information like that as I could because it didn't exist anywhere else. Uh, and so that's pretty much been the guiding light on my work over the years is keeping myself employed as a chemist, um, reproducing materials uh, in the laboratory here, and then analyzing them with whatever type of instrumentation came my way basically. And uh, so over the years, I, uh, I've amassed a wealth of analytical uh, and practical information on laboratory alchemy. And, and I'm in, in the process now of uh, reporting all of that. So I'm retired now. And uh, I've done the collection phase, data collection. Now it's the reporting phase. So I'm trying to um, put all my material into a series of books. So I have the uh, book on antimony just came out recently. Um, I have a whole three volume work on mineral alchemy that I'm in the midst of. So that's where that, we are. That's fantastic. That, I mean, that's a tremendous contribution, I'm sure, uh, for the future. Um, so as, as part of your overarching body of work, uh, which really seems to span from the entry level or, you know, as entry level as you can get for alchemy, um, somewhat just advanced uh, to begin with, but to, to the, you're talking about antimony, that's 
you know, that's, I would consider that an advanced uh, technique. You're talking about, you know, certain mineral works and things like that. Um, at least from what I understand, uh, I've, I've also seen TriStar Alchemy uh, kind of popping up on social media, posting some really great kind of digestible content, um, a lot of which you're giving like miniature lectures, short elucidations of subjects pertaining to alchemy. Uh, where does that project fit in with your overarching body of work? What are you, uh, what are you trying to do with TriStar Alchemy? Um, TriStar was actually Frater Albertus's dream. Um, he, his idea was to combine the classroom teachings with a, a laboratory, an actual manufacturing laboratory, uh, and an associated uh, clinic. And each of those would be one of the stars, the class, the lab, the clinic. Um, and the clinic would apply and, um, you know, uh, keep track of the utility of the various medicines that the class or the laboratory was producing. So say uh, the laboratory is producing uh, the oil of antimony, the clinic would be uh, applying that in practical matters and keeping track of what goes on clinical trials of the materials. Um, and that was Frater Robertus's dream. And I always mention that in in the class lecture talking about you know, how I got into alchemy um, we talk about, or at least mentioned TriStar, and um, the we started teaching uh, classes here about twenty. This is my twenty-first year of teaching classes, and um, this actually came about due to my wife Karen. She um, she raises horses. One of her horses got a bad infection in her face; it was swollen up. And um, I gave her an alchemical medicine. It was made from antimony, put it on the horse's face, and it the shrink, I mean, the uh, swelling shrank down to practically nothing overnight. And it, she was to so totally amazed. She goes, who else knows how to do this? And I said, not many. Um, and so it, that was her mission, to make this live on. And so all these teachings uh, that we've been doing over the last years are due to her wanting to keep the line of transmission going. And that's true now with TriStar. Um, Karen said she's taken our classes as far as she could. We need to go up a notch, but she's not capable of doing that. And, and then right at that moment, practically, uh, we had a class and we had... Um, something happened where uh, we got a very generous donation to start TriStar and a whole team that pitched in to do it. So we have this like suddenly popped out of the blue when, when it was needed, uh, substantial um, funding to begin TriStar and a whole group of people um, willing and able to make that happen. So um, there again, it's maintaining the, integrity and um, the lineage, the teachings, to make sure that they're going to be perpetuated. Um, it's because, you know, I've been doing it for um, over 20 years, but there's an end for me too. So um, Frater Albertus didn't have that. I mean, he didn't make provision for the teachings to be carried on by anyone. Um, same with the PRS in Australia, they closed down and there's there's no one perpetuating the information, the teachings. Um, so TriStar is about doing that, making a nexus point where alchemists from around the world can come and uh, exchange ideas, uh, get ideas, uh, go to classes, find materials. Um, and it will help to keep the interest in alchemy going because I think it's still an area of, research that needs to be really um, addressed more seriously. Um, it's, it's always had this uh, strange aura around it as being a, a ripoff or a, a scam or something, um, something that never outgrew from the Middle Ages, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I think it's time to seriously sit down and, and look at what alchemy has to offer, at least um, in the realms of medicine. Uh, because I've seen 
so many uh, amazing things happen um, just personally and things that have been related to me um, over the years that um, there's definitely something to it, something worth looking deeply into. So, Yeah. I, I think also, you know, aside from it being having this aura of, you know, fraud uh, that has, has kind of been like projected on it. There's a stigma. It's also impenetrable to a lot of people that, you know, might, might have an inkling of belief or want to learn more about it. And I, I noticed on your, uh, on the TriStar Alchemy website, you know, one of the bullet points of, of the, the mission or, or the work that you guys are doing is, you know, decoding alchemy for the modern era. And, you know, there's lots of new demographics in alchemy. I see young alchemists popping up all over the world, um, like almost every week now, I think perhaps emboldened by, you know, uh, the amount of, 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 um, maybe like chemistry that's just done in classrooms and in colleges and things like that. But what, what exactly does that entail for you guys decoding alchemy? What, what misconceptions or areas of obscurity do you find yourself having to clarify most often? Uh, well, what alchemy is to begin with, and there are a lot of takes on that. I mean, there are as many takes on what alchemy is as there are alchemists, I think. Uh, not that any of them are wrong. They're, it really boils down to an exploration of what nature and reality really is uh, and the laws that are supporting that. Um, so there are a lot of ways of getting into that, but just some of the ideas about uh, laboratory work, um, especially in the higher uh, works of working with metals, minerals, there's, there's not a lot of clear information about how to do that. Uh, and it's easy to get tripped up and create serious poisons uh, if you're yeah. approaching it the wrong way. So um, there are a lot of tips and techniques that explain the laboratory works uh, and how to go about them. Uh, especially things like antimony, you know, very toxic material. It's right up there like arsenic. Um, so if you don't treat it the right way, um, bad things can happen. It was banned for 100 years because of that. Um, physicians had to take an oath that they wouldn't use antimony compounds uh, for uh, close to 100 years. Oh, wow. Uh, just because of the serious poisonings that went on by people who thought they knew how to prepare the antimony and weren't doing it right. Yeah. Well, to tack on to that question, maybe here's a fairly elementary one, but I think an important one. Uh, what do you think the key, because I've asked a few alchemists actually similar questions, you know, uh, but what do you think the key difference between alchemy and chemistry uh, is, you know, you yourself being uh, a chemist and an alchemist? Uh, I'm, yeah. I've had to struggle keeping the two paradigms separate. Um, the history of chemistry is the history of alchemy, at least up to about 1700. So all the old books talking about old chemistry, they're really talking about the development of alchemy. Um, the main difference is that alchemy respects the invisible realm as well as the physical realm um, that and, and science is really coming full circle in that they recognize that the observer has an effect um, things are alive um, which were previously thought to not be um, so science is coming around full circle to the ancient uh, wisdom teachings uh, but that's the main difference is that in alchemy, things are alive and we, um, we treat them as living beings, as sentient beings, uh, whereas in chemistry, they're just uh, commodities that um, have no life. Yeah. And I see lately, you know, moving within, I would say, like an academic, historical or, or religio-philosophical paradigm you know I, I have a lot of conversations with those people and I, I kind of adjacently work in in those fields 
uh, regarding esotericism, I'm seeing the same thing, you know, with history and with philosophy and sort of, if you want to call like, you want to call it like the ontology of the self, you know, for a long, for, for a while now, we've been under this kind of uh, postmodern positivistic um, sort of, you know, ideology that has even viewed the person as kind of just this inert material uh, that, that somehow um, miraculously has self-aware consciousness. And, and that's sort of, that's, it's being challenged, you know, absolutely. So it's, it's kind of happening um, in all sectors, which I'm finding very interesting. It's probably this kind of ennui that we've had is, is probably just not doing it for us anymore. Um, But again, it's good to have sort of both finding this, uh, you know, triangulating, finding common ground, this, this third point. Yeah, yeah. Um, alchemy is becoming accepted as a legitimate <laughs> field of research in academic circles. Um, there are a number of uh, science historians who are delving into alchemy uh, a little more deeply, and, and they're not quite so hostile towards it as, you know, in previous times. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, there is a some uh, there's one Lawrence Principe, he's uh, associated with uh, Johns Hopkins, I think. Uh, um, anyway, he, he does um, some research on the period around Boyle, Robert Boyle and Isaac Newton, their involvement in alchemy. Um, and he and uh, another partner of his, William Newman, they study this area um, pretty intensely and they're uh, they're alchemist friendly, um, sympathetic at least um, to what was going on at the time, and they reproduce some of the experiments um, mm. in the laboratory to show their uh, viability. And it's not just some, uh, you know, mystic words in a in a textbook, but they're actually doable processes, um, even though they're hidden under a obscure language very often. Mm. Well, I, I um to to sort of follow up with the the chemistry versus alchemy topic. I, I remember reading your in your book Real Alchemy probably for the first time, actually. That uh, you know these these processes that that eventually became associated or or generative of alchemy as we understand it today, coming from ancient Egypt, which is a fascinating um, historical kind of idea to me and um since then actually i found a lot of evidence in support of this you know zosimus of panopolis and i mean that's that's in the hellenistic period but but certainly um you know seeing that the egyptians were kind of really the first natural sort of proto-scientists and really philosophers it would seem as if they taught uh, a, a method of inquiring into the nature of existence um, to the Greeks that they then called, you know, philosophia. Uh, and I see actually, you know, your, your story, that natural curiosity with, with, with rocks that you told it, it very much in line with that ethos. But I guess all that is to ask, does, do you find alchemy corresponding in any significant way to what the Egyptians would, would have called, you know, considered magic, Hekka? Oh, Absolutely. I uh, <clears throat> I studied Egyptology for a number of years um, just to delve into the origins of alchemy. I mean, all the all the historical texts say that alchemy, at least in the Western world, began in ancient Egypt. You know, uh, and then they jump ahead to the Hellenistic period, like you mentioned. Uh, they're, they're in Alexandria, and that's like towards that's the end of Egyptian civilization. They say nothing about the Egyptians. Um, the Greeks took all their stuff. Um, they started visiting Egypt, you know, early on, 800 BC, um, 600 BC, that whole period in there. Um, and they began learning in the temples, and then they uh, translated it into language compatible with the Greek psyche you know they made it logical but all of the greek philosophy if you know uh, egyptology uh, you can see where they took apart ancient egyptian mythologies and uh, techniques and 
and basically rationalized it into the Greek philosophy. Um, mm. One of the main, um, so I've delved into Egyptian Heka magic. Uh, in fact, I have a, a, a manuscript I'm having published right now in Egyptian magic. Um, oh, that's awesome. A lot of it is uh, Egyptianized uh, Golden Dawn rituals, a lot of it, so pentagram, middle pillar, that kind of thing. Uh, but anyway, I've delved into Egyptology, and one of the things in alchemy, uh, for example, uh, and this is a major one in Egyptian uh, metaphysics, um, they talk about the ka and the ba of the person uh, as two major um, functions of the uh, the psyche. Those are the major fractions of the psyche. And the ba and the ka could take on their own autonomous existence and, and float away in the netherworld. The, the ka represented like all the life functions, the life force of a thing. Um, whereas the ba represented um, everything that was unique about that person, whatever made it that person. It was like the soul of that person. Um, and then the, the cat, which was the, the corpse, uh, would be mummified as like a, um, sort of like an amulet or a, a talisman, a vessel that is preserved now from corruption. Uh, and according to um, stories, legends, the, um, the Egyptian priesthood, uh, when a person died, the Egyptian priesthood could um, detain the person's ka and their ba within the temple enclosure and purify them through ritual techniques and then unite them into what they call the ach. And the ach was now a glorified being who could come and go between the, this realm and the, the afterlife. And so they, they would do the opening of the mouth ceremony on the mummy, which would grant access to the Ach into the mummy. And he could come and go and make his presence known and, and then go back into the netherworld. So this was like a, a, an amulet where he could inhabit, make his presence known and, and such uh, at will. And so you can see this is all very alchemical. Um, yeah, I see the tree of prima in there actually. Exactly. So in alchemy, they talk about the three essentials, the, uh, the life force, the soul, the body, soul, and spirit, basically they're salt, sulfur, mercury, and how they are separated and then purified and then put back together into a, they even use the same words, a glorified being. So these are living medicines that have gone through life and death and rebirth, sometimes uh, multiple times, according to the alchemical processing um, and each time they become more and more spiritual and have that effect uh, on the body um, and mind that's actually fascinating you know I've, I've studied a bit about the the parts of the soul of egypt i've never kind of really put that together in that way before um so i'm, I'm assuming that you have your own kind of uh ritual practice yeah, yeah. So does that factor heavily at all or significantly into your alchemical work? Uh, do you do them separately or do they kind of mesh together? I know I've, I've spoken to um, other alchemists. I spoke to Phoenix Aurelius a couple of months back and he was kind of telling me his approach to it, but I'd be really fascinated to hear your own. Uh, it all meshes together. Um, after you practice. My background is, like I mentioned, uh, Golden Dawn and uh, Franz Barden techniques. Um, and I studied uh, Golden Dawn and, and Rigardi's material um, and the works of Franz Barden for long enough that I felt comfortable converting it all to Egyptian style because I was drawn more to the Egyptian. And so, like I mentioned, the uh, Egyptian magic scroll that I have um, 
it contains a lot of the Golden Dawn material Egyptianized. So one of their things, the, uh, the pentagram ritual, uh, the middle pillar were two major um, Golden Dawn rituals. I have them in an Egyptianized version. Um, and so you could open your circle, um, do projections on uh, whatever you're working with. Um, but after a while of doing that, I mean, my, my personal working was to open the temple, basically, clear the space and charge up a, uh, a Eucharist, which was one of the alchemical tinctures. Uh, I would put a charge on it and consume it and, and assume the God form or whatever it was, and do a meditation and close it up. And that would be the ritual. Um, sometimes in working in the lab, I would use Barden's techniques of uh, accumulating an element and then projecting it into um, one of the flasks or materials that were in operation. So um, Barden's techniques I use more in the lab as I'm moving around. Um, and I think after doing practice for so long, um, separately and in like a prearranged, I had a temple room that was 12 by 12. So I had the luxury of a whole room as a set up as a temple for uh, several years. Um, and I think you can just call that up at any time, any point now. So you're standing in the middle of the lab and you're standing in the middle of your temple, uh, regardless of space and time. So you can call that up very easily without all of the um, paraphernalia. You know, if I need a, a sword or a dagger, it's right there in my hand at will. Um, so, yeah, it all meshes together, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. So when you're in the lab, um, it's very easy to call up sacred space when you're doing something. Yeah, I, you know, the 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 whole uh, etymology in 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 laboratory, right? There's there's that word oratory in there, right? The place of prayer, uh, yeah. which which I find fascinating. In speaking of of the Golden Dawn stuff, I, you know, I'm a Golden Dawn magician myself for for many years now, and I'm I'm involved in the the Cicero lineage. I run the Asheville Temple. Um, here in North Carolina. So I'm very familiar uh, with those rituals and stuff like that. And I'm actually really excited um, if that manuscript is, is going to be published. Uh, I, I can't wait to get my hands on that. But we were talking a little bit about the legacy of Frater Albertus. And there's there's definitely right that that uh, intersection of him with, with Regerty. And what I always found fascinating was I read uh, The Philosopher's Stone. Um, and there's there's some commentary in there, and uh, it's either in in the the expanded book or I was reading it somewhere else. Regardy, basically, you know, he was a psychologist and uh, a, a psychotherapist for a while, and in, in those early days, and so he, uh, you know, taking that that Jungian tack, you know, he uh, Jung having really piggybacking on the work of Hilbert, Herbert Silberer. Uh, yeah. started discussing, you know, the, the psychological perspectives of alchemy. And and so even in the present day, a lot of the Golden Dawn, modern Golden Dawn tradition is much more, I would say, psychologized or or let's just say, you know, if you want to, you don't want to discount the, the numinous aspect of it. It's what they call, quote unquote, spiritual alchemy. But yeah. at a certain point in his life, while Regerty was convinced of the sort of like the spiritual analogy of alchemy after meeting frater albertus he he kind of goes on record and says no it, this stuff is real and i've seen it i've seen transmutations happen and so there's been a lot of kind of talk or i want to say you know people wondering how closely frater albertus and israel regardy worked together i mean do you, can you speak to that i mean do you know anything about their partnership <clears throat> um yeah um at first, I would say that the um, the book you mentioned, the uh, Israel Regardi and the Philosopher's Stone, um, that was written by uh, Joe Leshevsky, who was a student at the PRS. He was one year behind me in the class successions. Um, 
So we never actually met, um, but I'm familiar with him and um, his work. He mentions in there a chemist working at Paralab. That wasn't me, by the way. So <laughs> okay, the, the previous chemist, when I uh, showed up, left it a mess. There were no notes. It was a nightmare. So uh, anyway, that was not me. But Rigardi and Frater Albertus um, actually studied together at the Rosicrucian Museum in San Jose. Um, this was early on when Frater broke off in around 1960 to begin the PRS. Um, the plan was for Rigardi to help him uh, and present the spiritual, psychological angle of alchemy while Frater would address the um, laboratory works. Um, so they were planning to work together, um, but I think they butted heads a few times. Um, Frater Albertus assigned Rigardi a task of um, creating different colored glass of antimony um, by manipulating the, the furnace and ingredients, you can create different colors of glass from antimony. Uh, so he brought her assigned Rigardi this task. And I guess uh, Rigardi had a mishap with his furnace and breathed in a big, big uh, blast of uh, arsenical and antimony vapors that scorched oh, his lungs, which, which weren't all that good to begin with. He did have asthma pretty bad. Um, I remember in later years, um, I, I had some communication with him. I sent him a, um, a tincture of gold and antimony, and it, uh, it brought some relief, but it didn't uh, fix his, his lungs. Um, a friend of mine was with him in Sedona when he died. He was also a, a co-worker at the PRS. And um, he said they had just eaten dinner and went to sit down and, and talk in the, in the living room. And um, he said, suddenly, Rigardi got this little boy look on his face and said, oh, here I go. And he closed his eyes and he was gone. <laughs> oh, man. Wow. Wow. I, I, I mean, that's really nothing to laugh at. I'm laughing because it's an incredible sort of story. And uh you know, definitely as somebody coming up in, in, in a modern Golden Dawn lineage, particularly one that, you know, has was consecrated, was founded under Regerty. It's it that's a really cool story. Um yeah. A cool yeah. bit of, of occult history right there. Uh <laughs> I actually recently visited his uh his grave. We went to Sedona, but we, we were surprised to find that he's not actually buried there. We went uh, I spoke at uh Philosophical Research Society a couple months ago and I visited his grave. Um with because uh, he's buried in L.A. Uh, with my friend Sky Mathis, who I think you know from Philosophical Minds. Um, yeah, yeah, I remember. I remember listening to his uh, listening to you probably first talk with Sky, and one of the things that was really really interesting to me at the time on um, the things that you guys were talking about at a little bit of a higher level, right? Because Sky is he practices alchemy. Um, yeah. This idea that minerals can kind of grow and set seed. And, uh, I, I think you kind of mentioned it earlier, you know, in your story about, um, about minerals and rocks and things like that. Where does, where does an idea like that come from? Is that, is that an ancient thing or, or is that experiential? Have you sort of seen it happen? I've, I've seen crystals growing that shouldn't. Um, and there's quite a bit of text material on uh, what they call artificial minds, the idea, and and Falconelli and Cancelier, um, some of the French alchemists, they were into this quite a bit, and that is, um, the idea was that you would gather the materials that, uh, say, gold forms in, gold, uh, gold veins form in certain conditions. And so you gather all those conditions together and generate a, a an artificial womb to grow the um, gold in. And then you would seed it with um, 
seed. And the idea was that, um, you know, plants have seeds, animals have seeds. Uh, why wouldn't the third realm, mineral realm, also have seeds? I mean, there are three realms in nature. Why would nature quit at the mineral realm and not give them seeds? <laughs> They're all alive. And mm. so, so the idea is that the mineral kingdom has its form of seed as well. And that um, it could be seeded into this matrix and actually grow uh, gold, silver, or other metals. Um, there's another one using um, rainwater. Um, inside of rainwater, there is said to be a universal seed of nature called the gur. And once that is collected, and if it is uh, prepared and then moistened with the proper ratios of water fractions, it would grow metal, uh, even gold and silver if you got the ratios just right. Uh, but that universal seed, you could cause it to grow into plant life or animal life or mineral life, depending on the uh, way you watered it with the different fractions of water. Mm. So it's all work, alchemical work, just using rainwater. Mm. Yeah, that, that kind of reminds me, thinking of it, you, you know, in, in a magical context, just because that's that's my the strongest area of my background, is the idea of working with certain elementals, you know, these these intelligences of, of, of Earth, let's say the gnomes and, uh, you know, sylphs and undines and and, uh, and salamanders and things like that, the, the elemental intelligences. There's a school of thought that says, you know, sometimes these elementals will become apprenticed to a magician uh, because we're the only ones that can kind of help them evolve at a, f at a faster rate, really. Um, uh, it's fascinating to me, it just kind of popped into my head that, that correlation between approaching it magically and then also what you're talking about with the, the, the realms in nature and things like that and, and, and evolving the consciousness of these things. Um, yeah. And that, they actually brought up a, a thought about a um, an adjunct to the middle pillar ritual um, and the whole golden dawn ideas on magic. Um, you know the the pentagram ritual mm -hmm. and how it it disrupts like um, various habitual thought forms that build up in your aura. For example, uh, the pentagram ritual can blast those apart. Um, and then the middle pillar is a way of circulating the energy around the different chakras and all. Um, there's a technique, uh, I call it the etheric vortex, which, which is an adjunct to these. Um, so you've gone in, you've done your pentagram ritual and you blasted apart these thought forms and stuff that's rubbed off under your aura. Um, and, and, they're kind of like laying like rubble around your aura now, but like this Terminator, you know, they can reassemble and start going back up. If they're, I mean, habitual thoughts you always have, you know, um, they'll start to reassemble um, in your aura, like thought forms. Um, so the etheric vortex is a, a way of getting rid of that by um, first you would, um, establish your middle pillar and you do the pentagram ritual which blows everything apart and then about 20 30 feet above your head you formulate a white vortex that comes down your middle pillar all the way down through you and down into the earth and it's like this white pyramid or a uh, tornado going down into the earth and drawing all that stuff that you've broken up out of your aura with it and, and going down, down, down into the earth. And then once it's down about 50 feet, you, you know, stomp your foot and leave it down there and do something else. Now you'd like flush the toilet down into there, but, but all that stuff you flush, like you just mentioned, it's like pure gold to lower elemental realms. Mm. Um, so it sustains them and actually raises them up, evolves them, our waste material uh, wow. that we flush out like that. So it's a way of flushing out the aura, not just uh, breaking it up. You have to keep breaking it up over and over. This actually cleanses it out of your aura. Um, 
So that's fascinating. Yeah, that's fast. Is that something that you, you're going to put in the in the Egyptian magic book or? Yeah, yeah, it's in there. Awesome, awesome, cool. Uh, actually, on that same tack, I, one of the other things I noticed on the TriStar Alchemy website was, you know, you guys talked about assisting in the conscious evolution of humanity, and I think, I think that you know, kind of going with this idea of 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 evolving uh, each of the kingdoms and elementals, I think that might be a good point to touch on, you know, because we, I think as these arts and sciences and spirituality generally continue to penetrate through the mainstream, there's a lot of ideas and associated images with, let's say something like the evolution of humanity. You know, what does that look like? What does that entail? Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how you envision that, or at least how you approach it alchemically, whether that's, you know, your own personal work, whether that's continuing the legacy of Frater Albertus or, or in TriStar Alchemy. Uh, that's, it features into a whole definition of alchemy of being, you know, evolution, increasing the Frater Albertus called it the increasing the vibratory rate. Uh, and, and you have to understand something about occult metaphysics to understand what that means, you know, uh, raising the vibratory rate. But um, it is, a, again, plays back to evolution, um, raising something to a more spiritual level. Um, and that's what alchemy is about, showing how nature is put together and how it is evolving and how... Um, how we fit into that picture because we all have a part to play. Um, it's not just some random thing happening. Um, and as we understand our part and we can do what it is we're here to do, um, that advances everyone. And so part of that process is helping people to understand who they are and what they are and why they're here. Um, so that they can actually accomplish those things. Um, we all have talents and skills and um, things that we need to learn as well. Um, and so as we get to know those things about ourselves, um, it advances ourselves, um, makes us more spiritual, which in turn brings everyone up around us. Um, so it's, it's the evolutionary wave that uh, increases, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. And I, you know, I assume it's, it's, you know, one of the things that I, the early questions I had on in, in, in my alchemical sort of journey was, well, is, is, is the alchemist themselves by learning the art of alchemy and sort of learning to, to dissect and understand the inherent patterns in nature, uh, you know, are they evolving at a faster rate than somebody who's taking the tinctures that they're preparing? You know, so so that's that's kind of something that's been a question for me. I you know I tend to think that the 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 alchemist themselves is the alchemist themselves uh, definitely learning to participate, and I guess maybe what you what some people might call demiurgy, you know, the sort of renovation uh, of the the material world. Um, and so I, I would assume that that would kind of expedite, you know, another term that you guys use was self mastery, personal self mastery. So that's, mm -hmm. you know, I, it, it kind of answers my, my, my question on, on what you guys are, are, are doing, like how that affects how that is affected through the work that, that you guys are doing alchemically. The, the work affects you as well. And in fact, they, it's an old saying that um, the alchemist who makes the medicine, uh, they receive the full psycho spiritual effects. Whereas giving the medicine to a person, uh, they receive the full medical effect. Um, which is miraculous itself, uh, just the medical effects of some of these materials. Uh, but the alchemist who has prepared them, the, there's a connection that's established in the, in the whole process. 
and uh, that is released when you take the medicine. So they're much more uh, initiatic, I guess, in a sense. Um, they much more profound on internal levels than, than just the medical effect on the physical body. So uh, they have a uh, enlightening uh, aspect to them. Mm. Well, uh, everybody that comes on the podcast towards the end of the conversation gets a canned question. I ask it to everybody and it kind of puts them on the spot, but, uh, we've covered a lot of ground today, uh, specifically with alchemy, ancient Egypt, uh, metaphysics, magic, etc. But, uh, for anybody that's listened to this episode, uh, could you recommend three books that, uh, in any of these areas, uh, would help people to sort of get more acquainted, dig a little deeper. And of course you can recommend your own. Uh, three books. One, one that's kind of the classic is the golden chain of Homer, uh, written in 1723, Anton Kirschweger. It, there's actually two volumes. Uh, there's a, online set that goes to chapter 17 and then stops for some reason there should be 25 chapters and and then another 25 chapters so look for the full version it's sort of an abc on on alchemy and uh, alchemical ideas but filled with experiments and processes that you can apply um i could give a plug for my own book real alchemy because it's uh it's a primer. If you have no idea what alchemy is about, it's it's just that a primer to start you up. Um, so it it covers some basic ground very easily understood and can it can point you in the direction of personal interests uh, to delve deeper. Um, a third book, gee, I would look for the. Um, the works by the PON, Philosophers of Nature, um, Jean Dupuis. Uh, there's a work called uh, Spagyrics, and also the uh, Mineral Works, which is a three-volume uh, set. They're very excellent. Their curriculum is almost identical to PRS, uh, so uh, I would highly recommend those. Great. Well, Robert Allen Bartlett, thank you so much for coming on today. Um, I'm really looking forward to everything that you've got for us in the future, and I'm looking forward to see uh, to seeing the evolution of TriStar Alchemy. And I wish you nothing but the best, man. I hope we get to talk again. That would be a great pleasure, and thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. <laughs>